Well, we've come to this closing chapter of the Year of the Arts at Biola University with some 80 events this past year, gallery openings, concerts, poetry readings, lectures, food, dance, opera, even random acts of culture. I think it's fitting that we culminate this year with a commencement address from one of the most prominent and profound Christian voices in the art world, Makoto Fujimura. As a tribute to Mako's cultural influence in the arts, the Board of Trustees has conferred on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Fine Arts, which was given to him at last night's post-baccalaureate degree ceremony. Mako's an artist, a writer, speaker, recognized globally as a cultural influencer. A presidential appointee by George W. Bush to the National Council on the Arts. Mako has contributed internationally as an advocate for the arts, engaging with decision makers and influencing policies on the arts. An acclaimed painter who has exhibited in galleries worldwide from New York to Hong Kong. Mako was the youngest artist ever to have a work acquired by Tokyo's renowned Museum of Contemporary Art. Recently, Mako's Four Holy Gospels, a stunning illuminated manuscript of the Gospels created in celebration of the 400th anniversary of the King James Version Bible was displayed at New York's Museum of Biblical Art. Mako's paintings incorporating the layering of Japanese materials, precious metals and bits of gold and platinum were compared in the Wall Street Journal to early Renaissance painting and described in the Weekly Standard as a joyful gusher from a well that has long run dry. Students, may you be joyful gushers, all 670 of you on so many wells that have long run dry. Mako is not a quote unquote Christian artist, but he's a Christ follower whose calling is art. He told the Associated Press, I don't wanna use the term Christian to shield me away from the suffering of evil or to escape in some nice ghetto where everyone thinks the same. Mako is no stranger to suffering. His studio was three blocks from the ground zero place of 9-11, and he was deeply impacted by the horrors of that day. For him, faith, art, and suffering are intertwined. Reflecting on that day of infamy, he wrote, death spreads all over our lives, and therefore faith must be given to see through the darkness to see through the beauty of the valley of the shadow of death. For Mako, beauty is a harbinger of hope. As one New York art curator said of Mako, he's a profound believer and I'm totally secular, but he is like a professor to me. Fujimura's paintings allow for skeptics such as myself to do the one thing that secularism has labeled as a sign of weakness, and that is to hope. His work profoundly explores the liminal spaces between light and dark, heaven and earth, the sublime and the ordinary. As founder and director of the international arts movement, Mako gathers artists and creatives around the world to wrestle with the deep questions of art, faith, and humanity to engage the culture that is and to create the world that ought to be. Mako, you remind us that at its best, Art wrestles with the deep questions of existence and in sowing do offers us glimpses of the world that ought to be. Mako Fujimura, we have welcomed you once this year to speak to our students and our staff and our faculty and friends and, and we welcome you back. This culminating day on this year of contribution to the arts, but it is just the beginning at Biola University. Today you've returned along with your wife, Judy, and daughter, Lydia. Where are you? Please stand so we can recognize you, Judy and Lydia. I believe there is no more fitting commencement speaker than you, Mako Fujimura, to crown our year of the arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our friend, Mako Fujimura. Wow, what a day. Thank you, President Corey, and thank you, 
Stan and the board of directors for inviting an artist to speak at a commencement service. Um, it's kind of risky, you know, to <laughs> invite an artist. And I'm happy to be here with you. At Beacon High School, a creative charter school in New York City, an incoming freshman class enters first into a room which is central to the school. It's literally located at the heart of how the rooms are configured, and it is the art room. And the first and the only question that this incoming freshman class is asked is this question. What do you want to make today? What do you want to make today? <laughs> My daughter, Lydia, had interest in the school, so on a spring day over five years ago, we toured the school near Lincoln Center. We were ushered in by student leaders who gave the tours, and many of the class sessions were led by these students. And we, too, were invited into this first room, the center room, the art room. And the art teacher proceeded to say that it usually takes about three months for a student to answer that simple question. What do you want to make today? It is not an easy question to answer if you think about it. Because we're so used to doing what we are expected to do in school. Just to pass this exam, just to pass this portion of the class. We live in this utilitarian, pragmatic world in which the bottom line questions usually deal with questions of usefulness, or profitability, and often these decisions are made in a Darwinian competition of who can win out the battle to be the most powerful, to take what you can out of life. In this scarcity mindset of such a dehumanized system, we usually don't ask, what do you want to make today, but instead, ask, what can I do to take from others or to do as little as I can to get the maximum results? Now, this art teacher went on to say that when the student does decide, let's say, to pursue photography, then a series of questions follows. What type? of photography? Why photography? What are you trying to say through your photographs? Whatever the student end up answering these long list of questions, these answers are then relayed to other teachers in other classrooms. So a math and physics teacher will take up a conversation on optics and refraction. A history teacher will show how photography has changed since its early silver print days. And chemistry teacher will then pick that conversation up to help a guide, guide student understand how the chemical reactions induce remarkable results in these rare silver print photography. The teacher told us that indeed his best student was now pursuing chemistry with a Columbia Pro University professor, and he considered this student to be his greatest success as an art teacher. Imagine that. Answering a simple question can lead to spending four years discovering pursuing answers. What do you want to make today? is not just a question. It is inquiry. It is a way of life. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, 
so idealistic. Or you might be sitting there excited with me, <laughs> with, with the other parents, wondering, like, can I enroll here today? <laughs> To both of these reactions, I should note that Beacon High School faces many challenges, like every public school in New York. And though the results are very good as far as children graduating and going on to colleges successfully, there is a gap between the ideal and reality. But we do, we must pause and ask, why is this question so resonant to many teens in New York City? that many desire to go here, even if the parents think it's idealistic. Imagine sitting in that art room, full of art materials mixed all around you, mixed with a smell of coffee and freshly baked cookies, <laughs> colorful paint, large glue jars, and scissors neatly lined up and ready to go. You are surrounded with te technology to design, help you design your creative thinking. You are 13, wondering to yourself, who am I and what am I to do with myself? In a confused days of our chaotic lives, when, when have you had somebody ask you, what do you want to make today? It's disarming. Now, many of these children sitting in the room, including my daughter, survived 9-11 and were ground zero residents. If you have been traumatized or simply caught in a degenerative spiral of negativity that pervades our culture today, what kind of hope does that question provide? On the morning of 9-11, the terrorists answer the question, what do you want to make today? With vengeance, with evil vengeance. The world they desired was a world full of ground zeros. And they exercised their imagination to bring down all hope and aspirations of thousands of people with destructive acts of terrorism. They were using their imaginations. And ironically, the shock of that morning for all of these contemporary artists in New York surpassed all of the shock art created in contemporary art of the 90s. The artists themselves found that this reality in front of them, ground zero, Gaping hall of hell was far more cruel, far more bleak, and far more destructive than any single artist could ever depict. So to ask, what do you want to make today, is not an idealist, idealist escape from reality. To ask, what do you want to make today, is a quiet resistance against the destructive fears dominating our world today refusing to submit to the inevitability of corruption in ideologies. On 9-11, two forces of imagination collided. On one hand, destructive imaginators who imagined over and over their destruction. And on the other hand, men and women who imagined and trained themselves to risk their lives to climb up the falling towers. The rescue workers' art was in their supreme heroic sacrifice. 9-11 made it abundantly clear to me that both are works of imagination. We swim in the ecosystem of imagined actions. Our imagination forces us every moment to choose life or death. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses, witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. 
the God of the Bible implores us in Deuteronomy. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when we answer the question, what do you want to make today? We can choose this life. In fact, we must have faith, do we not? in the future to create anything. Hope is the base material, a foundational reality of what is to be built, whether it be on the ashes of ground zero or in the classroom of a charter school in New York City or here at Biola University and your future endeavors. On the way back in a taxi, from Beacon High School tour with my daughter and my, my wife, I had a revelation. What if, I asked myself, what if our churches asked the same question, what do you want to make today, to every single person entering the door of our churches on Sunday morning? What if ch the church was ready to respond to that question, what do you want to make today, with resources and network of experts. We serve a creative, creator God, as the Colossians passage noted. And this creator created us to be creative in the same way that God gave Adam the authority to name the animals in Genesis 2, God invites his children today to co-create within God's parameters. We cannot create ex nihilo, but we are all artists with a small A, and we are asked to work through our brokenness and our fears. We are created for love, and love is creative. So what would happen if every single person who follows this creator asked the same question, what do I want to make today? And further, if we become an ambassador to the world to help ask, what can I create and how can I help you ask the same question? What if we answer this question filled with the creative Holy Spirit of God every moment that we are awake and helped others to do the same? Would we have a world more beautiful, a world more compassionate, more caring and daring? Would we see our occupations differently? Would we see our universities differently? Would we see our motherhood our fatherhood, our brotherhood, and our sisterhood differently. My sister-in-law is an accountant, and she recently told me that when she has the numbers all lined up, organized in the right way, she finds this thrill. <laughs> and she said, it is like finding a beautiful painting to me. <laughs> She finds beauty in the numbers. So no matter what you're called to do, we are not only homo sapiens, but we are homo faber, creative. We are marked with our capacity to make, and we are artists, all artists in this sense. So today I ask you, the graduating students of Biola, what do you want to make today? It's a question posed to, of course, those leaving a school instead of being asked as you enter one. But deep questions in life are the same, whether you are at a starting point or at an ending point. Would you make today a future which is worth beholding? Will you choose to dedicate your days to create 
a world that is worth passing on to your children. Do not be washed away by apathy, entropy, and decay. Instead of threatening the world with terrorism and denying the fundamental endowed capacity to create in love, we need, in the quiet of our daily service, give sacrifice so that the others may live. Art and love are fundamentally the same act, operating on the same sphere of our lives. You see, art is not this peripheral, frivolous activity, but it has to do with the deepest core of existence. It is to love yourself and your neighbors. Art defines what makes us human, and fully human, we will be making things. We either create toward this love or away from that love. If we sit idly to this reality, we abdicate our responsibility to steward culture. To say that we do not create while consuming culture all the time is to let the commercial forces determine our identities. So instead of consuming, go and create. Be an entrepreneur, a nurse, a teacher, a missionary, an engineer, a politician, a scientist, or a chef. Are you called to the arts? Do not forget to learn to ask yourself, what do you want to make today as well? I find that artists are guilty of not asking this question today. Art has become a kind of a game you play in this elitist circle, divorced from everyday concerns. Artists are more concerned with being in the right circles, <laughs> to be recognized rather than focusing on creating art that only that person can do. And by the way, if any of you are entering an MFA program, if anybody, any institution, any ideology of an art school crit tells you that you cannot make, use the word creative, it's actually taboo in the art world today. If you find yourself in that situation, then transgress. <laughs> but if you must transgress to make a point, do remember to transgress in love. You see, choosing life sometimes is transgressive because choosing life is to create a new vista and to create is to love. What do you want to make today? I am asked when I tell this story, so what did your daughter end up doing? <laughs> she was accepted by Beacon. I'm very proud of her. This, this is the day to embarrass your sons and daughters, right? So, <clears throat> she was accepted by there, but chose to go to a different school, a Quaker-based school whose mission statement is to, quote, do more than prepare students for the world that is. We help them to bring about the world that ought to be. So she could not escape the idealism <laughs> after all. <laughs> As I am proud of her, as I'm sure you are, parents and grandparents of your children. Do not allow yourself to miss this opportunity to think about your contribution to the world, to ask this question, what do you want to make today? May your lives be marked by choosing life, to create and love, even standing on the ashes of our ground zero conditions. Congratulations. God bless you. Mako Fujimura, thank you for uh, sharing with us this gift to graduates and to guests and to all of us. Um, a gift of a question that we should spend the rest of our lives pondering. Thank you so much, Mako Fujimura.
Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.